So let's start, let's go on. Welcome to my talk about um, how Bluetooth was forced to go and handle a hybrid of multiple responsive device system. More or less, this is focused a little bit on electronic shelf level devices, but it is generally valid for all types of IoT devices which are working with Bluetooth. I'm Horst Kautschitz, I'm the vice chair of the Bluetooth SIG ESL working group and additionally the director of the embedded systems at Fusion Group, which is formerly SAS Imagotech, which is situated nearby of Graz. First starting, what is an electronic shelf label? An electronic shelf label, short called ESL, <coughs> is a device which is, when you say this, which is mounted on shelves in stores. You can update prices over the cloud, make stores faster and more responsible, and for sure bringing more IoT background into the store, but stop marketing things. What is it really? It's only another IoT device which we are all having. It's only communicating over Bluetooth, and it's, to be honest, only about a picture. So what is here interesting in it? Especially when we're talking over what does that mean from a kind of an IoT device? Let's go over to focus on what are the requirements and environments where such devices are installed and what they need to do or to have. First of all, this device is inside of a retail store, like other sensors, other control mechanisms, home automation. It is showing a picture and logging mostly data, e.g. sensory, sensor data, temperature from fridges, bringing this up periodically to a cloud. It receives power only from a battery, at least two coin cells or bigger ones with one additional more. It mostly communicates on, until, on a proprietary radio technology, which were based on 2.4 gigahertz and therefore storing or sharing a lot of bandwidth with other devices. And in a normal store, what we know as store, retail store, you have at this at around 20,000 devices inside. So, this is really impressive, but what are the requirements for ESL system itself? Such a device needs to react on commands in 10 seconds when you trigger something from a cloud. It needs to be guaranteed of no manipulation of the picture. It has a life expectation from 6 to 10 years without changing the battery, including picture changes up to 6 times, blinking LED. And it needs to share the frequency spectrum or bandwidth of all other types of technologies like Zigbee, Matter, Flat, Bluetooth Mesh, and for sure 2.4 GHz wireless LAN. Which means in a normal store you have additional devices inside of 5,000. To give you a roughly number, this means at least you have 25K of such IoT devices in one store. We are talking here on stores like we know from Spa, when we are going on for having further bigger ones like Interspa or American side stores, we are talking here on devices of 100K and up. <coughs> the big challenge what we forced were in the year 2020. In 2020, the invasion of the IoT devices comes up. Everything got digitalized completely. And based on our technology, what we had, we got really into troubles. The troubles were that in the same environment, a lot of other technologies, matter threat and products are coming on. So the interoperability inside of the store got really worse because we were not able to connect anymore with devices. Other based on interoperability were using the same kind of frequency band and bandwidth, which means the interference in such stores grows up extremely. We are talking here in normal stores on a packet loss of 40% on the Bluetooth band. The packet error rises up. Stability goes down, throughput goes down, the power consumption of these devices rises, for sure, of retransmissions. The responsiveness were lowered of retransmissions. And finally, based on European Union regulations and all other, which is good, 
the security requirements go up. So we are talking on really not cloning ESLs, compromising of communication, firmware updates, root of trust, data integrity. And finally, every vendor of such things has its own standard, which means from kind of carbon print or footprint, um, it is the way to go more or less for retailers also with such amount of devices to have one standard for reusing and reducing carbon footprint in background. This was really a challenge we forced and we were sitting there and we're thinking, what the fuck, how you solve that problem in a near time for getting better? We had a lot of things and we were thinking on the go with standards, but the most important requirements we had from this list were completely contextionary. On the other side, we need responsiveness, we need throughput and security. And this is against complete power consumption. And finally, interoperability, compatibility with different devices against our unique competitive advantages which we already gained in patents and so on. How to go on with that? And how to do this in years? What we have done is we settled and have done a lot of re-engineering what is the base to set up. And finally, there was one thing which we go up. We were really thinking on go with the standard and take the base at Bluetooth Low Energy. Bluetooth Low Energy formed for us the best base in interoperability because coexistence and co-location already exists. Kind of security, there were also techniques included improvement. The responsiveness were not given because in the Bluetooth there was no system which can handle IoT devices in an efficient manner and in a manner which, is, which needs low power, so time triggered fix. Then there is the for the compatibility, you can create own services and profiles and we're thinking this is very good. A profile is for example what you know when you are connecting your your, uh, your device or your phone, your headset with your uh, handy. And uh, on power consumption, there's also no efficient handling. The throughput was good with one ampit. We were thinking that's enough for transferring the picture in time. So the final solution was just that Bluetooth. And if Sheldon Cooper was saying, everything is better with Bluetooth. So we go over and said, Let's do the journey and go the way. But the way was not as easy. The first thing is you need to join or come inside of the Bluetooth SIG. The Bluetooth SIG is no organization in a traditional sense or regulatory which is working like in traditional sense. It is a lot of hierarchy where a lot of groups, committees and boards. The final is it consists of the core specification and a bunch of add-ons, which are profiles, services, and all are interconnected to each other on specifications. Reading and understanding the core specification itself and the impact takes over at least one year. This is really a project. Then you need to understand the complete process, how the specification becomes released. This I will talk further. Then when I finish the last two points, this one. Then you need to create an interest group in the Bluetooth SIG for pushing standards forward. When you want to create an interest group, that means you, that you need at least five members which are very interested in your project for getting inside of the Bluetooth SIG. And we are talking here on five additional members and mostly really on big members. We are talking here about Nordic Semiconductor, Silicon Labs, Broadcom, Garmin, um, and all our IoT vendors, all BLE controller vendors, mostly in background. And the greatest challenge is get the adoption for a specification. The process is like that you are really at first need to create an interest group, then going further for getting an okay for creating a work group dedicated for it. Then you have the freedom to have your own group which is working on that dedicated making specifications, running through a long-term process, which is going up to a board of architectures, arrival of architectures, coming back, 
every other members from the core specification group and also other working groups are very interested in putting by you inside additional add-ons what we can use in a good manner. And finally, the focus should always be to have all integrated in the core specification that all can use. So it's a really a hierarchy. And then finally, you go over to the adoption of a Bluetooth core specification. And the adoption means that you go further to a complete testing specification process, which needs five st stages. And at least at the five stages, what you have, three members need to adopt your test specifications. And then there is the final IOP testing. This is one of the most known things. The IOP testing is the interoperability testing, so-called in the Bluetooth SIG. And the interoperability testing is nothing other than a big event where you as company go there, have a test bot setting or a test setup where other companies can test the test specifications designed against your defined test bot and therefore saying the specification is fulfilled and my device is compliant. And for that, you need at least four companies which are doing that and saying, I have a device which is specified or tested against this and is working like the specification. And then you get more or less qualified to get into a Bluetooth release, in a core specification release. So more or less, you need to have a lot of friends also internally, which means we are working a lot together really with the big Bluetooth controller manufacturers uh, in this case, and also driving the complete specification group for the electronic shelf level service in background, and also I'm sitting in the core specification group additionally. Um, Based on that, anyways, Bluetooth, uh, we are going, what is the need for an ESL implementation now? Uh, the base on what we set that up was the specification 5.3 and where we had a lot of dropbacks. There was no periodic scheduler inside. Uh, where a BLE host, like we are talking on BLE host here on the standard Nordic development kit or the Bluetooth controller inside of your handy was able to manage clients like what we had in home automation or also in every BLE current device, what we have here, in a bidirectional manner with respect on low energy, time triggered. This was not possible. The only thing what in Bluetooth was possible that you were sending out informations and somehow someone was responding. So no time scheduler, nothing deterministic. This was completely new to Bluetooth. Bluetooth itself, the specification groups and the core specification groups really cried up a little bit because we're saying, hey, this is a base what we have or we need more or less for IoT devices, IoT device handling, managing for power consumption changes, looking on it, working in an efficient way. Further, we needed to check and gain up that the security standards which were implemented in Bluetooth have a good encryption from the host to device. But there was no possibility to further encrypt data, which you are then transferring further to a cloud, for example. So a complete end-to-end -end encryption was not possible without man-in-the-middle attacks. Then, an efficient way for data transmission was also not given. There was no dedicated service, there existed one, but this was not efficient enough. And finally, we needed to create this own profile and service. So the journey began, and we were sitting inside and were turning out that working with Bluetooth is not as easy based on the fact that our main requirements are not given. And secondly, Bluetooth SIG is a little bit... Uh, they need to take a lot of effort in it. The belief-based ESL after three years, we reached this goal. And the goal was reached in that, that we founded our own working group. Um, and we were adopted with our complete needs 
in the Bluetooth core specification version 5.4 in 2023. What we have done? We've created their own scheduler, and their own scheduler is called Periodic Advertisement with Responses. Short power. Periodic Advertisement with Responses is a time-triggered scheduler on which you can manage up to 32K of devices with one host device in a time-triggered schedule and with a defined matter of responses and when the client device responses to the BLE host. We need, we, we are talking here on round trip times between 1.56 second, uh, 1 seconds to 81 seconds while you are triggering all devices. In kind of security, we have extended the encryption for advertising data. And uh, finally, with the Bluetooth core specification of low energy, was also adopted or extended. For the responsiveness, this was also going inside of the scheduler. Throughput also, and in addition, we changed a little bit the object transfer service for getting more efficient and reliable. For the compatibility, we implemented a service and their own profile for the electronic shelf label. And for the power consumption, we also take the way for putting this into the periodic adver advertising with responses. What were the great impact on that? The great impact on that were that we were said, okay, the scheduler is in general valid for all types of IoT devices. All type of Bluetooth devices can use that. Therefore, the way to go for us was put this inside of the core specification that all type of technologies can use it in Bluetooth. The greatest impact and effort and advantage was that periodic advertising with responses is now the base for Bluetooth LE audio, which comes up there and which were the invention from us and they took over this idea for have a periodic scheduler for working in a power consumption efficient way for transporting audio. So in overall, the journey takes a lot. We put a lot of effort inside. We are putting this all really, our mindset and our knowledge inside. Periodic as vertical with responses has a lot of background with our old system, what we drive uh, in, in further times. So what is periodic advertising with responses? Periodic advertising with responses is a time scheduler, which is inside driven in the BLE controller itself. It is nothing other than it has a hard interval, a full one, which can be defined between 1.6 seconds or 81 seconds. It can be divided in 128 sub-events, and in each sub-event, an amount of up to 256 IoT devices can sit, which means you can maintain with this one up to 32K of IoT devices. A sub-event can contain up to 250 response slots, which means communication back to the BLE controller. And it has a distinct channel for jumping over to a data transmission. So the scheduler itself is only used for short commands and responses, like, hey, how are you alive? What is your temperature? Please blink the LED. So all what you need for IoT devices itself, overall, and when you need to transfer more data time or more data, you switch over to a data transmission mode to on one. This one is pushing out of this row and syncing automatically back. How is this working? Each sub interval, for example, starts with a so-called AP sync package. In this AP sync package, there is a timer information and additionally, there is data inside. At this time, all clients in the ESLs were looking at this package, and based on this package, we know I'm in time, and I know that my timing schedule is correct. Additionally, where is data? Where it is saying, okay, you client number one, please respond in response slot number one, and give me your temperature. At this time, it is really triggered. 
the, the IoT device is sending back the information to the BLE host. <coughs> Otherwise, the second one is to say, okay, jump out of the row, get into data transmission and come back. Very easy under normal circumstances, so no magic inside. What is the challenge we have forced now on that? Um, for BLE controller vendors, this was a complete new situation with what we were forced. First of all, for most of them, and we are really talking on, on really quality, like BLE controller vendors, manufacturers, such system for having so much time slices, we are talking here milliseconds or microseconds, we are not able to handle in the scheduler. The scheduler of Ver was not prepared for such systems. The picture itself is not the full truth because at the end, B sites in the slots which are empty, you need to transfer data like pictures, like firmwares or other things. And finally, the BLE host controller also needs the time for scanning on things. So getting back feedback. In overall, this kind of parallelism forced the BLE controllers, vendors or manufacturers to really rethinking the scheduler and getting in a better quality than they ever had before. We talked here, for example, on implementations with the first one on a development time of half a year up to a year until this got stable completely. Until now, we are in the phase that we can say that the most big vendors, which have also a very good open source mindset and thinking very good open source, are already in the base to handle such a system. Finally, this is a base what we formed here, where IoT devices and new systems can set completely up. You can configure the scheduler fully in kind of what responsiveness I need from devices, how much devices I want to have, what is really, and uh, how much time the devices should use for communication and how much power consumption you would need. And the final, this is our gap, what we have taken three years over that, which we are bringing into the core specification and now open for everyone to use. I hope this was a big league overview, a short overview uh, about what we have done and where we are going inside. So the further journey is not, is not the end until now because there is only one big drawback what we see in the scheduler itself. It is the case that the IoT device can communicate from himself without saying to the BLE host, and now want to communicate, or you can now communicate. So a full master-master system, which is the base we are working on to get a complete dynamic schedule. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? For, for sure, it depends on the, on, the, on the controller what you have, but we are talking here uh, on 10 to 15 meters under normal circumstances. Uh, mm -hmm. Normally, such ESL devices has a TX power of 7 dBm, 8 dBm, as usual. That was you also have with the, with the Nordic chips or Silabs chips as standard we are using. Um, we are using standard normal chips also in access points. In general, it is used what we have. We are also uh, putting our service or system inside for support in, in the full access point range, like we are talking here on Meraki, Nordic, Cisco. We have all BLE controllers inside with, with standard antennas. So nothing, nothing big power or something like this. Um, in this case, we really need to say that the coexistence of Bluetooth is very well done and the adaptive frequency hopping wave implemented is working very, very fine. The only thing which is really creating a lot of interference in background is uh, wireless LAM with 2.4 when it's extensively used. 
And the second one is that you have vendors which are not addicted to check a little bit on Bluetooth so you can spamming the frequency band. We are talking here mostly on lightning systems uh, which are proprietary and these things. I've got a question for you uh, regarding the Bluetooth SIG. Uh, what is the manpower needed to handle such a job? How many <laughs> people do, do you need to, to handle specifications? It's an, an, enormous, an enormous circumstances. It is like that the main PLE chip manufacturers are taking over the main job in the board of architecture. We have mostly a team there of 10 to 20 people which are working full time for that. Uh, we are at the ESL, at the working group. Uh, for me, it is a time of um, 15 hours per week to 20 hours per week to go with that. Um, now it's a little bit more less because we have adopted already the specification. Now we are doing hardening and extensions. Um, but the good background in the Bluetooth SIG is that all kind of, of, of members are able to join the group. And uh, there is a high interest from BLE controller manufacturers and also maintainers of home automatization systems to bring the stand this standard, the electronic shelf level standard, forward because of the BRWR. So roughly 20, 20 hours for me per week, 15 hours. Thank you very much. I hope, I hope next year maybe we're getting more into technical details.